to our 10 a.m. gathering this morning. My name is Dan, one of the ministers at Norell and Anglican Church. I get to lead the service today, uh, and I'll be, I'll be preaching a bit later on Romans 3, which is um, really exciting. But why do we gather together? We gather to meet with God uh, around His Word in prayer uh, and to encourage one another to keep following the Lord Jesus. Uh, and we do that a number of ways. We hear from God's Word, and we say things to one another. We sing to one another. And that's what we're going to do now in our first song. We're going to sing to one another that we might consider Christ and all He's done. So let's stand and sing. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. My Lord. Take a seat. A few notices for you um, about what's happening here at Menangle. The first is there's a ladies' coffee morning happening Friday the 2nd of September um, uh, at 10 a.m. So please come along if you're a lady. Um, that seems like an important qualification there. Next is the Grandparents Conference. The National Grandparents Conference um, is a conference happening at Feature Anglican Church, 17th September. 
Uh, this, the aim of this conference is to help equip grandparents to engage with their kids and their grandkids um, to invest in them spiritually, to leave a living legacy is the, is, is the idea, a living faith legacy, to pass the baton to the next generation. So it's encouragement for, for doing that. Um, so if that interests you, if you're a grandparent, um, put the 17th September into your diary. I now have a, a bit of a longer announcement, a um, bit of a longer notice. Uh, Jim and I, so uh, Jim, the senior minister at Norellan, um, uh, have had a number of calls and inquiries about the new diocese, the diocese of the Southern Cross. You may have heard about this in the news that, um, and, and the news reports on these things in a very interesting way. Um, so... Um, some of you might not be aware of what's happened, um, but other, others may be. What I wanted to do is to fill you in, give you some background um, on what's going on and why this Diocese of the Southern Cross has been created um, by the GAFCON um, Australia team. Um, so if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, hopefully as we work through this longer announcement today, it might by the end. Uh, so... The Anglican Church of Australia, I wanted to give you some background. Anglican Church of Australia is separated into 23 dioceses, um, including our diocese in Sydney. And they operate fairly independently from the Anglican Church of Australia. It's more like a fellowship of dioceses rather than kind of a top-down, um, rather than a rigid structure. It's a fellowship of dioceses. Now, in recent um, years... Much of the worldwide church, Anglican and otherwise, has lost confidence in the Bible as God's good word for us, particularly with respect to sexual ethics. And so in many parts of the world now, there are clergy um, who are ordained who are living in sexual immorality, either outside, you know, in a relationship outside of marriage um, or in a same-sex relationship. And so the big issue here is the denial of the clarity and authority of Scripture. That's what lies behind this. Although the presenting issue is um, marriage and human sexuality, um, it's really the clarity and authority of Scripture that lies behind this. And, and, and the attempt to revise Jesus' teachings and the clear teaching of the Bible to conform to contemporary Western secular ethics. And so in response to this... GAFCON was formed in 2008. Have you heard of GAFCON? GAFCON is that fellowship, um, what does it stand for? The Global Anglican Futures, Future Conference. Global Anglican Future Conference. Um, now, it was formed as a fellowship of Anglicans who wanted to continue in Orthodox Christianity. Um, now, I want to read you something from GAFCON's website. So this is, this is how the website of GAFCON describes the purpose of GAFCON, what, um, what, what it is. The GAFCON movement is a global family of authentic Anglicans standing together to retain and restore the Bible to the heart of the Anglican communion. Our mission is to guard the unchanging, transforming gospel of Jesus Christ and to proclaim him to the world. The GAFCON journey began in 2008 when moral compromise, doctrinal error and the collapse of biblical witness in parts of the Anglican Communion, had reached such a level that the le leaders of the majority of the world's Anglicans felt it was necessary to take a united stand for truth. And that's what happened in 2008 with the first GAFCON conference that met in Jerusalem. Uh, and so this was, this was a fellowship, this was about a thousand Anglicans meeting together um, who were all committed to upholding the, the teaching of God's Word. Now, you might know that recently in Australia... A number of things have happened at the General Synod recently. Um, uh, the Australian bishops didn't pass a motion affirming the traditional view of marriage as between a man and a woman. Twelve bishops voted against that um, out, of, out of 22. Now, the Bishop of, Wang, uh, of Wangaratta as well, he, has de he decided to bless same-sex unions. Um, and the appellate tribunal which is a, a, tr a tribunal of the, of the national church, decided that marriage wasn't a salvation issue. 
Now, the Anglican Church of Australia has been divided for some time, but this week it came to a head, and there's a conference that happened this week um, in Canberra, the GAFCON Australia Conference. Um, and what, what happened came out of the fact that in Australia, uh, many faithful Anglicans have been concerned about revisionist teaching for a long time. Uh, many have already left Anglican churches. Their ministers had faced sanctions in some dioceses from revisionist bishops. Um, and so in some areas of Australia, this had reached such a crucial point that action needed to be taken. And so this week, Peter Palmer... Let me just get the rest of my notes. Um, Peter Palmer recently approached GAFCON. So he was a, he's a minister in uh, Brisbane. He approached GAFCON due to his concerns about the theological issues of his own bishop. And so he actually resigned his position and he started a new church. But rather than simply start an independent church, Peter continued as an Anglican minister as the first uh, minister and congregation the part of this new diocese, the Diocese of the Southern Cross. And so this is, there, there is a new diocese now in Australia called the Diocese of the Southern Cross. It's not part of the Anglican Church of Australia, it's separate, but it's formed by GAFCON. And unlike traditional dioceses, you know how a diocese normally is, ge is geographical, has geographic boundaries? Well, this diocese doesn't, which means new churches uh, can be formed f f around Australia and connected with, uh, into this diocese. Existing Anglican parishes and structures will remain unchanged. Um, so that's really important to know. It is people rather than a parish who leave the Anglican Church of Australia on grounds of conscience. Many members of a parish may leave together to incorporate a new church that will formally join the Diocese of the Southern Cross. Existing parish property won't be transferred to the new church either. And so Peter Palmer and his congregation met in a club for the first time um, because they didn't have any church property to meet in. But what does that mean for us? Well, nothing is going to change for us. Um, in, in, for the time being anyway, because um, our diocese remains committed to the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Remember that the National Church is a fellowship of dioceses. Some are more conservative than others. Some, some are more faithful than others. Um, so nothing will change for those places that remain committed to following the teaching of Jesus. Just happily continue as they are. But for those in dioceses that are under pressure, um, for those churches under pressure to accept revisionist teaching, the launch of the Diocese of the Southern Cross is actually really great news because it, it's a, like a lifeboat for them to remain Anglican. To, to, they, can, they, can, they can consider to move to the Diocese of the Southern Cross and remain Anglican um, and remain under a bishop. Bishop Glenn Davies, who was the Archbishop of Sydney, is, is the new bishop of this Diocese of the Southern Cross. Um, but it provides these churches who want to remain faithful a means to still be Anglican, but to leave the Anglican Church of Australia, which might be pressuring them to um, move away from God's Word. So that's what's happening. Um, the media has talked about a division, a split in the Anglican Church. Well, actually, no, that division was created already by those revisionists who wanted to, want to change the doctrine of, of Scripture and move along with the culture. Um, that's where the division has come. This is a necessary step that's taken in order for us to remain faithfully Anglican, in order for some people in other dioceses to remain faithfully Anglican. Now, that's a lot. Any questions? I can't promise to be able to answer them all, <laughs> but um, I can uh, promise that I'll take your questions to, to Jim if I can't answer them. I can direct you to the GAFCON Australia website, as well. If, you're, if you've got more questions, GAFCON Australia, G-A-F-C-O-N, Australia, um, they've got a website that has a Q&A about this new diocese. So that'd be worth reading if you've got more questions. But any questions from the floor before we move on? No? Okay, well, 
I think what I might do is pray for this um, new, yeah, for this new diocese that's been created. Um, pray in light of um, what has what has happened, and then we'll continue with our service. So let me pray for us. Father, we bring before you the tensions of, in, in the Anglican Church um, in Australia at the moment. We've, some of us have read about this with concern, about these, um, this controversy and division in our national church. We pray for those Anglican churches across Australia that, w- that, the, that the truth about Jesus would be upheld, that it might be taught clearly, faithfully and openly so that men and women and boys and girls might be saved and grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus. We pray especially for pastors and congregations where the local bishop is not teaching Christ and pressuring them to move along with the world, is not supportive of faithful gospel ministry. We pray that you would sustain them. We pray that that those unfaithful bishops might turn back to you. We pray for the faithful pastors serving, serving under those unfaithful bishops We pray that you would help them think through their situation carefully um, and what they might be able to do um, and maybe whether they might be able to join this new diocese, whether that would be a wise move for them. We thank you for the careful thought and planning that's gone into setting up this new diocese of the Southern Cross. And for Glenn Davies, we pray that we pray for wisdom and for courage for him as he takes up the role as bishop of this new diocese. And we do pray for those uh, congregations um, around Australia that may have strained relationships with their bishops. Um, Please give them wisdom, Lord, as they consider what to do. Uh, We pray for patience and goodwill um, of the faithful ministers of of Jesus um, and uh, just just wisdom as they wrestle with difficult decisions. Um, And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's continue with our service. Um, Now, we're going to uh, move into a time of confession now uh, because the Bible does tell us, we've actually seen this in Romans 1 to 3 over these last few weeks, that all of us are sinners and fall short of God's glory. That's what we've seen so clearly in Romans 1 to 3. And so it's good for us as we meet together to acknowledge our failure to serve God as he, as he deserves and to return to him with repentance and faith, remembering the mercy that is shown to us in the Lord Jesus. So let's confess our sins together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the Bible tells us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west... So far, he has removed our transgressions from us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I want to invite you, as you're able, to stand because we're going to affirm what we believe now about the Lord Jesus from Philippians chapter 2. So if you could stand with us, as you're able, um, let's say this together. Jesus Christ, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Amen. Well, please take a seat. Uh, and before Robin and David bring us the Bible readings today, let's say this prayer as we come to hearing God's word. Let's say this, this together. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Robin's going to come and bring us our first Bible reading. We're going to be reading from Genesis 8. Uh, Noah and his family and the animals are still in the ark, but now God is going to let the waters subside. So beginning at verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came back to him in the evening and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're continuing to uh, read in Romans. Romans 3.21 But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. He will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, 
we uphold the law. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he was circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who were not merely circumcised but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God and in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you very much for those readings. It'd be great if you had uh, uh, Romans chapter 3 open in front of you. That'd be really helpful today. But I want to ask you a question as we begin, and that is, how are you going Maybe, maybe it's a question you got asked as you walked in today. How are you going? I wonder how many of us would answer that question with tired. Anyone? Anyone else? Tired? Busy? There is a kind of pace to modern life, isn't there, that is just exhausting. Um, Alan Noble uh, is an author. I, I've been reading his, one of his books recently called You Are Not Your Own. And he reckons this modern weariness that we have has to do with the way our culture trains us to want to self-optimise all the time. Our culture says it's up to us to make something meaningful of our lives because we belong to ourselves. So it's our responsibility to try and constantly improve ourselves in every area of life. 
But that can be very wearying, can't it? Always working to better ourselves, be more productive, be more intentional. And even, even, we do it even when we're resting, don't we? I wonder if you're like me, when you're, when you're not working or not doing something that you feel is productive, you feel guilty. And when you're trying to rest, you're almost, you sometimes try and rest in a way that is productive. Where you're actually getting things done while you're resting. Productivity, self-optimization, that's what our culture leans us towards, trains us to go towards. But that can lead to real crisis for us. Perhaps when we retire and that, that outlet of productivity is removed from us that we, that we relied on for so long. Or perhaps during motherhood, um, if being a full-time mum, can lead to many feeling they're being unproductive and it can lead to a crisis. Or when chronic sickness interrupts our plans. Or when we just realise we can't self-optimise to where we want to be. We just keep failing to do it. Now, perhaps we think about our Christianity a bit like a self-improvement, self-optimising project a way for us to spiritually improve, to make ourselves right before God. Perhaps, this idea, this, perhaps it's this idea that leads us to come to church or to gather with other people during the week in a Bible study or to serve even at church. Sooner or later, though, if we operate under this idea, this project becomes a burden because we realise that we can't ever do enough. And our failure makes us feel anxious. Am I really worthy? Am I, am, I, am I really right before God? And how can I be sure of that? This kind of burden, anxious living seems a far cry from what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus promised to all who'd come to him. But so often it doesn't feel that way. The Christian life. Well, our passage in Romans today helps us to see why the Christian life, why coming to Jesus can truly bring us rest, rest from all our striving to be good enough, because it points us away from ourselves and to God, to the beautiful, refreshing truth that only He can make us right before God. So if you've got your Bible, it'd be great if you had it open to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Now, today in our series on Romans, we've come to one of those purple passages in the Bible. Have you heard that phrase used before? Now, the whole Bible is God's Word. All of it is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training us in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that. However, there are some parts of God's Word that are just so packed full of marvellous, weighty truth, and this is one of them. Romans 3, 21 to 26. Aussie scholar Leon Morris, you may have heard of him. He, he says this about this passage. It's possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Wow. Why does Morris say that? Well, it's because these few verses capture so well the heart of the good news about Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this paragraph almost phrase by phrase today which means we really won't get to chapter 4, um, but you might want to dig, dig into that during the week um, on your own. But we will get, it, get to it at the end. We'll fly over chapter 4 at the end because what we're going to see is that chapter 4 is really Paul trying to illustrate the point of, of this paragraph here in chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Actually, the verse 27 as well. He's trying to illustrate the main point from this passage. So, Romans 3, 21 to 26, begins with an incredible, but now. But now. Do you remember what's come before this point in Romans? We talked about it earlier in the service, didn't we? Three chapters of bad news. The wrath of God revealed from heaven against everyone, against non-Jews, so Gentiles, as God hands us over to our sinful desires because we reject Him and worship and serve the creation instead of Him. 
and towards Jews as well, chapter 2 says. Even the Jews, with all their privileges as God's people, having the law, having the sign of circumcision, Paul says even their hearts are oriented away from God, and so they don't keep his law. No one is righteous, not even one. That's what Paul concludes in chapter 3, verse 12. Everyone apart from Christ is against God, is contending against him. On our own, we are enemies of God. That's the conclusion up to chapter 3. Apart from Christ, we are his enemies. We stand guilty before God. We deserve his wrath. That's the bad news that's been painted in these first three chapters. What's the solution? But now. But now, verse 21 says, two little words filled with hope, like that cool, refreshing drink of water you might have after spending a whole day out in the hot sun. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said this about these two words. There are no more wonderful words in the whole of Scripture than just these two words in Romans 3.21, but now. Why did he say that? Well, we're going to see just in a moment. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested up, apart from the law. God is righteous. That means he's perfectly just and, and good and holy. He always does what is right. And that's what we've seen in the first three chapters of Romans, that he always does what is right. That when humans rebel against him, his wrath is poured out. That is God in his righteousness, revealing his righteousness in his judgment. But as we heard in, in chapter 1, verse 17, and now again in chapter 3, verse 21, God also reveals his righteousness in a saving way, not just in judgment, but in a saving way, apart from the law. Now that phrase, apart from the law, means that this righteousness hasn't got to do with keeping the law. The law can't save because if you want to go down that route, Paul's already talked about this in chapter 2, verse 13, which says only the doers of the law will be justified. And what have we heard about the Jews in chapter 2? <coughs> Excuse me. That they haven't been perfect doers of the law, which means they can't be made right with God through this law. All the law can do is reveal for them and for us how sinful we are. But now something new has come. God's revealed his saving righteousness apart from the law and apart from his old covenant dealings with the Jews. A new era has come. Verse 21 says, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. That's what verse 21 says there. And the law and the prophets is shorthand for the whole Old Testament. Paul is saying that the whole Old Testament anticipated and looked forward to and promised this new thing that has come. And what is it? God's freely given, costly gift. God's freely given, costly gift. Verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Here's the solution to the bleak picture we've give, been given so far in Romans. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That means we can receive the saving righteousness of God. We can be justified. That is, we can be acquitted of all the charges that should rightly be laid on us for our sin. And we can be declared in the right before God through faith in Jesus. Simply through faith in Jesus. But how is this kind of declaration possible? After all, what does verse 23 say, if you've got it in front of you? What does verse 23 <clears throat> say? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't deserve anything but judgment. And so how is it possible to be acquitted of all charges, to be declared right before God? Well, it's only possible if God gifts it to us. Verse 24, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
Being declared righteous before God is a free gift from God. It's free in that nothing compels God to give it. It's it's like getting an expensive gift from a friend completely out of the blue. Now, has that happened to anyone in the room? Getting an expensive gift from someone completely out of the blue? It hasn't happened to me Um, recently. um, I think it's a bit of an odd thing in our culture to do that, isn't it? Just to give, give a gift just because... Um, give an expensive gift just because. Now, we might expect gifts to be given at Christmas time by our close friends or family or um, at our birthday, um, perhaps on an anniversary. But to get one completely out of the blue is quite strange, isn't it? Um, we might even think, if we do get a gift completely out of the blue, what's the hidden motive here? I wonder what, what they really want from me. Well, there's no hidden motive in God. He gives completely freely, out of the abundance of his goodness, he gives this costly gift. And unlike what might happen between friends, there's nothing in us that compels God to give the gift. Nothing in our character. Remember, what does what Romans, what, what Romans 1 to 3 said or established so far? That we are sinners who've rebelled against God. We're actually contending against Him. Romans 5 will say that we are His enemies. So nothing in us compels God to give the gift. He gives it freely by His grace. It's a free gift. And it's a costly gift. God's righteousness is given freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, says verse 24. Now to be redeemed... To be redeemed means to be liberated through the payment of a price. Set free by payment. Like um, uh, another word you could use is ransom. So prisoners of war or slaves could be ransomed, redeemed in Jesus' time. Set free by payment. This is what's going on in salvation. God redeems his people through Jesus Christ. God pays the price we deserve to pay for our sin and gives us the gift of being declared right with him. All at great personal cost to himself. Because how does he redeem? Well, God the Son takes human form and is presented as a propitiation by his blood. That's how God redeems his people. Now, That image of propitiation or atonement is one that would be very familiar if you were an ancient Israelite. Because animal sacrifice was a big part of their religious life. Take the Day of Atonement, for example. This this was one of the most important days. It could even be the most important day on the religious calendar for the Jews. Because this was the day that the high priest entered the most holy place. This was the only time he was able to do it during the year. He entered the most holy place in in the temple after making a sacrifice of of an animal, a goat. And he'd sprinkle the blood of that animal on the mercy seat, that part of the the ark where God had promised to be especially present with his people. And the point of that was to atone for Israel's sin, to bring God and Israel back together again, to propitiate. That means to satisfy God's wrath against sin so that God and humanity might be reconciled again, brought back together. That's what atonement means, at one moment, brought together. Um, and that's what we desperately need as well. That's what chapters 1 to 3 have shown that we need. That's the great cloud that's been hanging over these few chapters, that we stand under God's wrath because we've rejected him. Uh, and we need a way to, for that wrath to be appeased, for us to be reconciled with God. And that's what God does in his incredible mercy. He gives this, gives this costly, free gift of propitiation, of redemption, declaring us right before him in the death of our Lord Jesus. Now, how do we receive this gift, though, this costly gift, How is it applied to us? Well, the very next phrase in your Bibles, in verse 25, says, it is to be received 
through faith. Received through faith. God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now we use that word faith um, a lot in our culture um, or, or, or sometimes. Well, how do we use it? Um, often we say something like, you just got to have faith. Just have faith, mate. How are we, how are we using the word when we, when we use it like that? What do we mean? We mean, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, th- things will turn out okay. Just have faith. You know, look on, look on the bright side. Be more confident in the future. It's going to be okay. Just have faith. But the word faith in Romans 3 is not just this uh, feeling of hope for the future. It is trust in a particular person. It is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And receiving God's gift by faith means receiving what Jesus gives, not through any work of our own, not through any work of the law. Which means faith isn't a work itself. That's really important. It's, it's like an open hand that's taking what God has done for us. It's taking hold of the redemption God's placing in our hands as a gift. That's what faith is. Trust in the Lord Jesus. So it's by faith that we receive God's free, costly gift. Now, it might be a bit surprising what comes next in the paragraph here. Do you see uh, in the middle of verse 25, this was to show. So here Paul is, is about to tell us the purpose of God's redeeming work. Now, surely that's to justify us, to make us right with God. Well, yes, but actually there's something else going on too. So have a look at verse 25. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. This was to show God's righteousness. Do you see what's going on here? The cross, Jesus dying, the purpose of this was to show that God's in the right in justifying sinners like you and me. It's to show that he is righteous. Because you can imagine the argument against all this, can't you? How can God offer forgiveness to people who deserve the very opposite and still be a good God? Because no good human judge would do that. A good human judge would make sure the guilty person has received appropriate punishment for what they've done. And so if God is a good God, then he would do the same, wouldn't he? He wouldn't just let the guilty person go free. Well, what the cross says, what Jesus dying for us shows is that God hasn't just let guilty people go free. That's not what he does, is it? God doesn't just turn a blind eye to sin. Jesus paid the costly price for sin, didn't he? That's what we've seen. And that shows that God really is righteous. As verse verse 26 says, he is just in justifying sinners, in declaring us right before him. So Jesus' death shows that God is in the right. And it also shows that he's in the right for passing over former sins. Now that's a really interesting thing Paul says. What does he mean? God passed over former sins. Well, I think it points us to to how God acted toward his people before Jesus came. Have you thought about this before? How did God's forgiveness of his people work before Jesus came? Well, God provided the sacrificial system, didn't he? Like we talked about with the Day of Atonement. The Israelites made sacrifices. And it was the blood of the animal shed in the place of the sinner that God looked on as paying the penalty for the Israelites' sin. And so he forgave the Israelites. That's how it worked, didn't it? What about Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4? Have a look at this. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, so what's going on here? Do you see the tension? How is it possible uh, for God to offer real full forgiveness for Old Testament believers if it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins? Well, it's only possible if God didn't punish Israel completely for their sin as he looked on the 
the sacrifice that took, took the Israelites' place. It's only possible if God postponed the full penalty until Jesus would bear it on the cross. Do you see that? God was able to offer real forgiveness to Old Testament believers because Jesus would satisfy God's wrath against sin for them and for us. So that means Jesus paid for Old Testament believers' sin, just like he paid for yours, your, your, yours and mine, if we're believers in Jesus. Every believer, past, present and future, is saved by God's work of redemption in the Lord Jesus. And that means that God is glorified by what Jesus has done. God is glorified. He's shown to be in the right and salvation is shown to be all of grace. That it's, it's a pure gift. There's nothing we've done, nothing Old Testament believers have done, nothing that we have done to deserve God's gift of grace. It's all of grace. And that brings us to the big implication for us in verse 27, that there's no room for boasting. No room for boasting. So what does verse 27 say? Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. There is no room to boast in the Christian life. There's no room for looking down our nose at others who don't know Christ. As if we're somehow better than them. Because all we have is a gift from the Lord Jesus. It's all God's work. It's not like we've worked together with God on this. I wonder how many of you know people uh, at university or might have kids or grandkids at university at the moment. Often at university, we've got to do group projects. Um, now, what often happens with these group projects, particularly at uni? Maybe at school they're a bit different, but particularly at uni, what often happens one or two people end up doing the whole thing, don't they? There's five or six people in this group and only one or two end up doing all of it. Friends, God has done the whole thing for us in salvation. We have not contributed anything to it. We can't get any credit, claim any credit for salvation because we receive what God has done for us by faith. And all faith is, is trust in the Lord Jesus. It's, f faith doesn't do anything. It doesn't achieve anything. It simply receives what God has done. And so there's no boasting, verse 27 says. And Paul's goal then in, the, in chapter 4, which again we're not going to look at in detail today, but Paul's goal is to illustrate this point that there is no boasting. Boasting is excluded not only for us, but for even the great Abraham. Even the highly esteemed Abraham was not made right with God by his works. That's Paul's point in chapter 4. He was declared right with God by faith. By faith. Now, isn't that amazing? Because that means that it's not justification by works in the Old Testament and then justification by faith in the New it's actually justification by faith, being declared right with God by faith all the way through the Bible. Now, what did Abraham have faith in? Obviously, Jesus hadn't come yet um, in Abraham's time, so it wasn't faith in the fully revealed Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It was faith in God's promises. Can anyone remember some of the promises that God gave to Abraham? Descendants, yes. Descendants, remember how he said, look, look at the sky. Uh, you will have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. What was so amazing about that promise? He hadn't had children. He and his wife were old, very old. Too, they were far past childbearing age. Not only that, they were, they were promised land. They were promised that their, their descendants would be a blessing to all nations. These were some amazing promises. What did Abraham do with them? He believed, Paul says. And that's what Genesis 15 says as well. So right at the beginning of the Bible, this is what we hear. Abraham believed the Lord and he, the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. Do you see that? 
God counting Abraham righteous, not by his works, but by his trust in God's promises. That's justification by faith, right at the start of the Bible. Abraham's not justified, he's not made right with God by his works, not by the law, not by circumcision, by faith in God's promises. And so where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with no room to boast. No room to boast for Abraham or for us. Because salvation is by faith alone. And that truth is so refreshing in a world that trains us to think we've got to try and be good enough in every area of our life. Well, we can't do that before God. We can't be good enough. But that's so refreshing because that means we don't have to carry the burden of trying to be good enough. We don't have to try to self-optimize enough to get to that point that, yes, I'm good enough now before God. I'm worthy of Him. We'll never be worthy of Him if we try that way because all of us have hearts turned away from God. That's the lesson from chapters 1 to 3. But by God's grace, in Jesus Christ, God has given us this free costly gift of redemption that we take hold of by faith and faith alone not by our work and if we take hold of that by faith then we can live our Christian lives not trying to be good enough for God but in joy and thankfulness that God has done it all he's made us right before him so now we can live in great joy knowing we're right before him knowing that there's nothing more we have to do knowing that we're in his family, knowing that we have the gift of eternal life. That's the good news of the Christian faith. That is refreshing, delightful food for weary souls. So let's thank God for that now. Father, we thank you so much (coughs) for this wonderful news that salvation, redemption, being declared righteous before you is your gift to us that we receive by faith. Thank you that it is not something we have to work towards, but thank you that we can receive it only by faith, that it is your gift. Lord, thank you that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, that you save us, that you make us right before you, that you bring us into your family. We pray for for those of us in this room who have uh, taken hold of Jesus by faith, that you would help us to live in light of that this week. Help us to live with great joy, knowing that you have done it all. We pray for those of us in this room who might not have taken hold of Christ by faith. Please help us to to know that this is not something we can achieve on our own salvation. But please help us to grab hold of this gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus by faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please stand as we sing again. We're going to sing Never Alone. So let's stand and sing together. We're not alone, for Christ is He. Emmanuel, our God come be. We're not alone. For to our world, Jesus has come, eternal world. And as he speaks, our souls let bear. Naked as shame, sin is made clear, and yet he clothes us in.
Please take a seat. What a beautiful truth that we're never alone if we're in Christ, He's with us. And we can come before God in prayer because of the Lord Jesus as well. And we're going to do that now. Barry is going to come and lead us in prayer. Shall we all pray? This is the day you've made, Lord. Let us rejoice in it and praise you for what you are. We thank you for, as we look around, we see the wonder of your creation. The stars, Lord. The tide coming in and out. You're in control of everything. The wonderful birds and singing, Lord. Even though it is, the whole creation has fallen, we can still see the wonder of your grace and plan and creation, Lord. We rejoice in it every day, and we thank you for that. Lord, we praise you for the Lord Jesus, God's only begotten Son, image of the invisible God, head of our church, and most important, our Saviour. And we do pray for this this morning, Lord, that everybody here this morning will have a personal relationship with our Lord. Lord, we do pray for our families and friends who do not know you, Lord. Because we know one day that we will all stand before you, Lord. And we don't want anybody for you to say to them, I don't know you. So we pray for your grace and mercy this morning, Lord. Just like you, you're, you're so... Uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for we've been our gracious Saviour, and dying on the cross for our sins, that we can have eternal relationship with you. We praise you and thank you. Help us to witness and tell others about the wonderful gift of salvation, Lord. We know it all comes from you, but we thank you and praise you for letting us be part of your perfect plan. Lord, we thank you for our little church here and we just ask your blessing upon it. Lord, we look forward to as and May Winnie coming, Lord, with the children. It's getting very near now, Lord, and we just pray that when they come, that we may be enthused to be involved in evangelism for the new generation in this area, Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are not well. We think of many of them, Lord, and we think of Terry this morning. Uh, Lord had a little mini stroke. We just he's back home. Lord, we pray at this stage that he will uh, hang on to the promises that you have written in your word, Lord, of comfort and assurance in this time of need. We also think of Celeste, the many ups and downs she's had in her life, Lord. Again, bless her and really minister to her the gospel of you, Lord. And also Leah. Leandra, Lord, we thank you for her faithfulness coming here. Lord, in times sometimes it's a bit of a struggle, but we thank you for her witness and her blessing may be upon her this day. And many others in our fellowship, Lord, are not well this time and struggled physically, emotionally, whatever it may be, that we cling on to your promises and we thank you for that, Lord. We think of our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord, who are struggling at the moment with persecution, in countries, Lord, where they hate you, Lord, and they hate your people. So we pray that you'll uplift them, and we know that, Lord, you will never leave them or forsake them, Lord. 
and we thank you for that. And finally, Lord, we just pray for the future of our little fellowship here and we may encourage each other to witness, to ring up to each other and try and build each other up, Lord, to your name and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please share with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Power and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Can I just indulge a bit? Um, uh, we've got a working bee coming up on the 3rd of next month. It's getting very close to, for um, Winnie and Nez to coming, so we like to have everything all done and ready for them. So please, if you've got time, let us know, or Daryl and uh, Kim, and we've we'll got plenty of work for you to do. Thank you. And also, if you want to please speak to Dan you've got any questions about the future of uh, GAFCON and our little area here, so I'm sure we've got a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, well, let's stand and we're going to sing our final song, which is a prayer that our souls might praise God, the King of Heaven. So let's stand and praise him together. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our service, uh, this part of the service is, is now pretty much finished. However, um, our gathering still continues. We have a chance to keep encouraging one another um, out with um, in, enjoying some morning tea by the stable. So we'll do that in a moment. But let me read what our God of grace has done for us. 
to finish our service. So from chapter 3 of Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What wonderful news that is. And it is in light of this truth that I say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.